Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Get Into It with Safir. If you have not yet done so, I invite you now to follow us on Facebook, like the page, and if you are on YouTube, subscribe below. Uh, tonight, we are going to have a very impactful discussion about a very key topic that permeates society today, and that is get real about reparations. Uh, reparations, by definition, uh, is the making of amends for a wrong that one has done by paying money or otherwise helping those whom you have wronged. One matter of certainty for all of us is the fact that this discussion matters. It matters because while as a country, we have issued reparations for some of our short-lived sins against people, we have never repaired the harms that have been done by our originating and original sin of chattel slavery. During this discussion, we're gonna explore some of the underlying factors of America's crimes against humanity that persist specifically for American descendants of enslaved Africans. From slavery to the slave patrols, from redlining and housing discrimination to the creation and relegation of blacks to ghettos in America. And from all of these things to violent policing and murder at the hands of those tasked with protecting us. A much controversial and divisive topic as it may be for Americans, reparations for descendants of enslaved Africans in America or the absence thereof is seen for many of us as a slap in the face of a people who continue to face oppression, discrimination, and most egregiously, the loss of life without as much as a slap on the wrist for perpetrators who vow to protect and serve us. For many though, the idea of reparations for the wrongs that American descendants of slaves continue to face is an idea that seems impossible to materialize. But to tackle this monumental topic, I have some of the most expert minds in the country to discuss this topic. Some very special guests. Uh, first up is William Sandy Darity. And he is also known as Darity and, and commonly referred to as Dr. Darity as I'll probably reference on tonight. And Dr. Sandy is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and African American Studies and Economics at Duke University. He is also the author with A. Kirsten Mullen of the new book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, published by the University of North Carolina Press. My second guest is Ryan Haygood, and he is one of the nation's leading civil rights lawyers and is the third sitting president and chief executive officer of the New Jersey Institute for social justice. Ryan has served as deputy director of litigation at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, Inc., where he defended a core provision of the Voting Rights Act, widely regarded as one of the nation's greatest pieces of civil rights legislation still today. And he did so before the United States Supreme Court. So at this time, I Welcome both Brother Ryan Haygood and Dr. William Sandy Darity. Both of you welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. Indeed, the honor is mine. <laughs> uh, so I will say this, uh, in making the case for reparations for African-Americans, Dr. Sandy, I'll turn to you on this. What would you say from a historical context provides justification for this action? Well, what we emphasize, emphasize in our book, From Here to Equality, are three phases of uh, American injustice 
that have resulted in a set of cumulative intergenerational harms to living descendants of the persons who were enslaved in the United States. Uh, and the first phase is obviously slavery itself, but it is inadequate to talk about reparations as being motivated exclusively by slavery. Uh, indeed, uh, the period of legal, uh, legal segregation in the United States actually was longer than the period of enslavement after the formation of the Republic. And so approximately a century of the Jim Crow period which was accompanied by a substantial wave of white mob violence activity uh, that resulted in the loss of black lives, uh, the destruction of prosperous black business districts uh, and, and the appropriation of black property. Uh, the most extreme example of course is what people are familiar with in the context of, um, of, the, um, of the, Tulsa, the Tulsa massacre of 1921. Uh, and other examples include the wave of atrocities that took place in 1919 that lead to the description of that period as the Red Summer of 1919. And this culminates with uh, a, a singular wave of atrocities that took place in the 1940s. The third phase is the phase that you've mentioned already, which is the post-Civil Rights Act period in which we observe uh, mass incarceration, we observe uh, sustained uh, police executions of unarmed blacks. We observe uh, continued discrimination in employment, credit, and housing markets. And then perhaps most dramatically, from my perspective as an economist, uh, a measure of the full effects of all of these kinds of harms in an economic context, which is the enormous racial wealth gap, which results in a situation where the average black household has $800,000 less in net worth than the average white house up in the United States. So from that context, Dr. Garrity, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for taking us through that brief journey, uh, which really explains how we've gotten to where we are today. Uh, but from that context, what would you say was the, the key origin of the wealth gap that we're seeing today that is so pervasive among us? What would you say was at the origin of that? So one way to think about it is that the origin is slavery itself. Mm -hmm. But I, I certainly think that there was an important moment after slavery ended in which it was possible to have actually addressed uh, the kinds of disparities that we are now observing, uh, which I think are, are a consequence of the intergenerational effect that are associated with this particular event that I'm going to highlight. And this particular event that I highlight is the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the 40 acre land grants that they were promised upon emancipation. This was a promise that was linked to restitution for their years of oppression under slavery. And it is a promise that was unfulfilled. As a consequence, the formerly enslaved received no initial stake in American society, no initial economic stake, while at the same time, there was uh, a, a sustained allocation of 160 acre tracts of land to large numbers of white families in the United States, upwards of 1.5 million of them under the aegis of the Homestead Act. And this meant in turn that they had the capacity to make the types of intergenerational transfers of resources Black Americans were long denied. Uh, and indeed, uh, the estimates that the scholar Trina Williams offers today suggest that at least 45 million living white Americans are uh, living white Americans are descendants of individuals who receive those 160 acre land grants and are beneficiaries of those 160 acre land grants. And as mind blowing as that is, because truly the evidence is obvious for many of us uh, and those who would do even just a little bit of study would begin to see how the disparities that exist today were, at, were, were rooted in anti-blackness, uh, rooted in um, a purposeful and long reaching attempt to relegate us to ghettos uh, as well as oppress black Americans and descendants of slaves 
uh, from an economic standpoint. Yeah, but, but I, I, I think, I think uh, a lot of people mistakenly attribute the kinds of disparities or inequalities that we observe today to bad behavior on the part of black people themselves. Uh, I like to refer to this as the black dysfunction hypothesis. And uh, a number of people try to make this argument to explain why we have these massive wealth differences. And I'd like to highlight two or three of these arguments and indicate that they're absolutely false. Uh, one of the arguments is that the racial wealth difference exists as a consequence of educational disparities between blacks and whites, and that black people are not motivated to acquire education. That, that's entirely inconsistent with the historical record. Uh, it's also inconsistent with evidence that we have now that if you take into account family income, young black people from families uh, with a similar level of income as a corresponding family actually get more years of schooling and get more credentials academically than the corresponding white youths. Uh, but in addition, if we're thinking about this wealth differential, uh, black heads of household with a college degree have two thirds of the net worth of white heads of household who never finished high school. Uh, another argument people make is that this is attributable to family structure differences. That, you know, we have too many female headed black families and that's what explains the wealth gap. Well, it doesn't do it either. Uh, in fact, two parent white, uh, two parent black families have two and a half times less the wealth than single parent white families. Uh, a final argument I'd like to mention in this context is the claim that it's because black people don't save enough, that we're too profligate, that we, we buy bling, we buy cars, we buy everything under the sun. Uh, but in fact, uh, the truth is that if you take into account a family's level of income, white families actually purchase 1.3 times as much as black families. And at every level of income, the black savings rate is comparable or similar to or even higher than the white savings rate. And so, uh, so it's not a matter of profligacy, it's a matter of a lack of wealth, which explains why the white families are able to spend as much as they do with a, a similar level of income. So besides the obvious impacts of slavery, uh, and this question is up for answer uh, by either one of you, uh, but besides the obvious impacts of slavery and America's failure to keep the promise of granting 40 acres and mule to the survivors of slavery and their descendants. What political and economic initiatives helped exasperate the still growing wealth gap that we see today? Uh, would you like to take it, Ryan? Or do you want me to continue? Well, you should, you're, you're on a roll, Doc. I think All you right. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, if we think about the, the 19th century, the late 19th century in the aftermath of slavery, it's the simultaneous provision of 160 acre land grants to white, essentially land handouts, if you will, uh, that are accompanied by a failure to provide black Americans with anything. Uh, but, I, but also uh, there was a wave of white led mobs that destroyed property that had been accumulated by blacks in the number of cities uh, I think I mentioned Tulsa, Oklahoma as an example before. Uh, there was a, a wave of 30 of these episodes or so that took place in the year 1919, which led to that summer being called the Red Summer of 1919. Uh, in my own state of North Carolina, there was a massacre that took place in Wilmington in 1898, which essentially destroyed a, 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 a comparatively thriving black community. And so in, in conjunction with the failure to allocate land, there was a process of destruction or appropriation of the property that black people had accumulated. In the 20th century, much of the emphasis of public policy on wealth accumulation has focused on home ownership and the promotion of home ownership. But this has been done in a discriminatory fashion so that it disproportionately benefited white and it's disproportionately harmed blacks uh, in, in, in the process of trying to, to become home buyers. Uh, 
Uh, and we can start with restrictive covenants. We can move then to the period in which redlining is being deployed by the federal government in conjunction with the private banking system. We can move next to the legislation in enabling the New Deal, in mm -hmm. which there were components to provide subsidies for home ownership, and those subsidies were disproportionately given to whites. And then perhaps the most extreme example, close to mid-century, is in the immediate aftermath of World War II, when the GI Bill is enacted. Mm -hmm. And under the terms of the GI Bill, Southern legislators made sure that its administration would be conducted in a decentralized fashion so that local authorities would have control over whom received the benefit. And, and so as a consequence, uh, particularly in the Southern states, but also in some of the Northern states like New York and New Jersey, there was a very sharp difference in the receipt of resources and benefits from the GI Bill between blacks and whites. In the most extreme case is probably the state of Mississippi where there were only two returning black veterans who received any type of, of benefit from the GI Bill. Very poignant points. Um, and, and as atrocious as those acts were, uh, you know, there's still evidence as well in government's attempt to dismantle the family unit in, in black communities. Um, and of course, at the core of the family and everything that spurs from that is a strong community. Uh, and so there were pieces of legislation um, associated with the New Deal that would even incentivize um, uh, mothers to really be paid or rewarded if, in fact, there was no father in the home. And then you also well, have issues yeah, where... I, I think that's a little bit inaccurate because, first of all, the New Deal did not, did not provide support for Black family. Uh, it was it was consciously written to uh, exclude workers who were domestic laborers and workers who were farm farm employees or farm hands, and so as a consequence, in at the point at which the the laws are enacted, the uh, the mid to late 1930s, such a high proportion of black workers were in, were engaged in domestic service and in farm farm labor that. Uh, that they were written out of the New Deal legislation altogether. So we cannot claim that whatever uh, structural things that we observe about the black family, we can't claim that it's the consequence of the New Deal legislation because uh, black Americans didn't receive the benefits of the new legislation for 30 years, not until the 1960s uh, when the civil rights uh, legislation is enacted. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that strikes me, Dr. Darity, about what you shared, and I appreciate that march through history, you know, as someone who is in New Jersey, you know, that story is not out there. Right? That's not a, a Southern story only, right? That is, that's a New Jersey story. And so one of the things that struck me when you were talking was that what you described in the way that the enslaved Africans endured structural racism in this country happened right here in New Jersey. So New Jersey is a state where black folks confront some of the worst racial disparities in the country. And, and folks don't often think about New Jersey in that way. And I think people, when they think about New Jersey, they think about it often as sort of a, a beacon for democracy, that New Jersey was a state that resisted slavery and that encouraged Southern states to end it as well. But, but the history is very different. So New Jersey is a state where slavery took root very, very deeply. This was the first Northern state to restrict voting to white men only. It was the last Northern state uh, to end slavery. It was a state that resisted the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments. And it was a state that has a racial wealth gap that was to your point, Dr. Darity, birthed in slavery. New Jersey was a state that gave more than 100 acres to each English settling family and another 100 acres for those families that had enslaved people on it. Sort of after slavery ends in New Jersey formally, it's a state that has its own form of sharecropping, which gives way to restrictive covenants, which gives way to in failure to give access to the GI Bill for Black folks coming back from war. It's a state that 
creates cities like Newark, draws red lines mm -hmm. around cities like Newark and Camden and Trenton. My colleagues at the Institute where I work, uh, Andrea McChristian and Laura Sullivan wrote this report called Erasing New Jersey's Red Lines. And it tells the story about how our racial wealth gap was conceived of. It was, it was birthed in slavery in the state. And so a lot of the work that we do at the Institute today is looking at racial disparities and unpacking what they tell us and, and what they don't tell us. We talk a lot about where those disparities come from. We've been thinking a lot in this particular moment. You know, folks have said that we're sort of in a, in a pandemic within a pandemic within a pandemic, right? That we're seeing the, the destruction of our communities because of the use of force from police involved killings of unarmed black people, right? We're seeing the coronavirus pandemic. We're seeing the, the pandemic of structural racism. We're seeing the way in which the cracks in our foundation caused by structural racism are causing earthquakes in black and brown communities. So to your point, Dr. Darity, I, I just want to lift up a couple of those things that we as black folks live with in the state of New Jersey. Uh, one is around the racial wealth gap. You know, we're a state of incredible prosperity. New Jersey is uh, the second wealthiest state in the country, uh, second only to Maryland. Mm -hmm. It's in New Jersey that the median net wealth for white families, $352,000 a year. I'm so, sorry, $352,000 net wealth. Mm -hmm. Highest net wealth of anyone in the country, white folks in New Jersey, $352,000. But for black families, the median net worth is just $6,100. And there is not a race neutral explanation for that dagger <laughs> racial wealth gap, right? You cannot point to your point, Dr. Darity, to black folks failure as a result, as, as the cause of the racial wealth gap. No, that racial wealth gap was created by design some hundred years ago and reinforced by systems, practices, policies, laws that continue to advantage those who descended from the enslavers and disadvantage those who would descend from enslaved people. And so the disparity, racial disparity, $352,000 white families meeting net wealth, $6,100 for black families meeting net wealth. That is a racial disparity created by design. And so to the point of your book, if we are to close the racial wealth gap, that too has to be something that we do by design. I was having a conversation about this issue. I'll share this quick story, which I, I love to share because it illustrates this point. On a campus some time ago, I was sharing the racial disparity to this audience and there were, you know, it was an active audience. There was a, a middle-aged white man who was in the front of the, uh, of the stage. And I, when I was reciting these numbers, I could see him having a, a visceral reaction to the numbers. Like he was, un, he was unsettled by them. Right. And so he said, you know, so what happens is folks know here is people will then resist the number. So I knew he'd be the first one to ask the question when I was done. As soon as I finished, his hand shot up. I called on him and uh, he said, you know, where did you get, you know, where did you get that that racial disparity number? Right. I know, Dr. Day, you encounter this all the time. So I said, you know, that's from our latest report. You'll find it in footnotes 27 and 28. We got it from Prosperity Now. Right credible national organization, so you shouldn't be resisting the numbers. So he's now satisfied that racial disparity is real. The math is, 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 is real. Um, so the next thing he says is, all right, well, so if those, since those numbers are real, here's what it means for black folks. The median net wealth is so low for black people. And then Dr. Derrida, he does some version of what you described. You know, black folks, they don't have the same level of college attainment. They're prodigal with their finances. They're spendthrifts, right? I mean, the reason he said he pointed to the low net wealth for black folk is because there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong in our, in our DNA, right? Something prodigal, deficient about us. Ultimately, the racial wealth gap in New Jersey is a function of personal failures of black folks. But then the third point he made, which blew my, blew my mind, was he said, and by the way, point three, I'm a white man. And I don't have a, I don't have $352,000 in wealth. I couldn't resist. I said, well, that, that my friend is a personal failure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's been no 
coordinated <laughs> effort right. designed to separate you from wealth. The reason it's so low for black folks is because there is a design to produce that result. And guess what? It's producing precisely that result to yeah. our disadvantage. And then began a, began a very interesting conversation around, so what does it mean for white folks to have been the beneficiary, the beneficiaries of unearned advantages? And how do you, or how do you think about repairing the harm from the cracks in our society to invest in those communities, black communities, descendants of enslaved people who have born, who built a country that they never were given access to the wealth of, the prosperity of. And so I, I think, you know, very, very, very often when you have conversations around reparations, the word reparations is often a curse word. You say that word, folks get fidgety, they start thinking, uh oh, you're coming for something that I earned. Uh, this wasn't given to me. My folks came here. They worked hard. They earned it. And if you all would just work hard. Or, or, or they weren't here when slavery took place. Uh, no. They didn't own slaves. Yeah, yeah. We, we heard it all. It's not their personal fault. But yeah. see, that, and, it's and it's not, and, and it's not, in a sense. I mean, it's not a matter of individual or personal guilt. Right. It's a matter of national responsibility. Absolutely. 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 And you can't acknowledge the sin without making the repairs. That's right. Because, you know, too often there are those who will at least offer sympathy <laughs> by way of their emotional cues, but without actually putting something in place to right the wrong, yeah. all you're doing is providing lip service. Yeah. You know, it's in so in our, um, pervasive in what we see, not only socially and how we interact with each other, but even when driving on the highways, there's constant reminders for us of what has taken place. One atrocity, for example, was the erection of Highway 147, where they tore down a black wealthy town called Halitown. And and when you think about that, that's in my hometown, Durham. Oh, there you have it. Yeah, no, I mean that's exactly what happened. They ran a highway through the middle of the black business district. Yes. Yeah. And how many times do we hear about Black Wall Street and other black affluent towns being ravished at the hands of people who just hated us because of our blackness. Yeah. Although we never at that point volunteered to arrive. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we talk about the, the, the crimes against humanity, it's really what we're talking about. Um, what I find is that too often the conversation of reparations gets derailed because for us, there's too much of an inappropriate focus on the emotional cost, right. which can't be quantified, right? right. We can't quantify right. Right. the right. value of the broken hearts that we possess, but, but that doesn't but that doesn't mean that payment should not be made. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, I think you know even even Frederick Douglass said there's no way that there's an adequate sum of money mm -hmm. that could be put forward to compensate for the uh, the horrors of slavery and what people have endured during slavery. But then he goes on to say, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, I, I know the um, the quote well, and, and, and he certainly stood for the type of justice that was necessary to remedy those wrongs. And Brother Ryan, you were going to say? No, I was. I mean, I really appreciate this conversation because I do think, you know, very often we have conversations that are sort of like the harm reduction conversations yes. in, in their nature. So it's like a, you know, particularly now thinking about George Floyd and the folks who, who, who've been killed since George Floyd, right? And, and those conversations are essential, but they are about how you stop law enforcement officials from doing harm to us, including the ultimate harm, including killing us. How do we, how do we transform policing in a way that we survive interactions, we minimize interactions, we make investments in strategies and communities that actually build us up? But bit, I think very often conversations around black people or empowering black people are really harm reduction strategies. But we rarely get to a conversation like this one where we lift up an affirmative vision for what it looks like for us to win. You know, what does it mean for black people in this country who've been essential to this country, uh, whose prosperity is attributable directly to black people? You can't imagine an America without black people, right? Materially, now I'm not talking about culture and entertainment. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about 
that this is one of the most prosperous countries in America is attributable to what black folks have done for it, right? Whole pieces of our being are in the soil of this country. It's a prosperous nation because black folks built it to be that. And so I'd like, I'd like, to, I'd like to share a passage from, from our book that speaks directly to your point. We say, um, all those who subsequently migrated to the United States have moved to a country whose contemporary promise of opportunity is anchored in its history of exploitation of black lives. The slave trade and slavery extended their tendrils into every fissure of the American economy, producing a hothouse effect that created vast national wealth. America's economic success was built by the unrelenting enslavement of black people. One can hypothesize a counterfactual chain of events where American economic growth took place without slavery, but this is the actual way in which it all began. Mm -hmm. And so I think to me, because of that, for us, the conversation has to be, yes, we need a harm reduction strategy. Police gotta stop killing us. Like we, that's got to come to an end. But when we live, right, how then do we win? Right. And you can't, we can't win if we're not talking about repairing harm from systems designed to hurt us. The policing system is the most uh, vivid example of how we die at the hands of police. But when we live, we often live under a system that is brutalizing us through policies and practices, disinvestment. So one, one that comes to mind right now, we're in the city of Newark. You and I, Safir, I can look out, look, you live there, I live here. Beautiful city. No place else I'd rather live than in this city. But we are also, while we're a beautiful city, we're a very challenged city. Right. Incredible poverty in the city exists along really extreme prosperity. Our downtown is a space where billions of dollars are being invested in projects that are completed, underway, or in the pipeline. The average person who works in the city of Newark earns $45,000 a year. We have one of the biggest airports, one of the biggest seaports, one of the busiest train systems. Newark doesn't suffer from resources. The challenge is that we have not had a system in the city to connect local residents to prosperity. Absolutely. And then when we do get home, so home ownership, when it happens in Newark, the median worth of homes is about $230,000. Millburn, yeah. New Jersey, eight miles away, the average home value of homes there, 1.4 million. Yes. So even when we get homes, and by the way, home ownership is very low in the city of Newark. Mm -hmm. About 80% of people rent here. And if wealth is the primary, if home ownership is the primary driver of wealth, and only 20% of Newark residents own their homes, and when we do own the homes, they're not valued at the level that they should be. How then do we generate wealth? How do we win? And I think for us, win, winning has to include a conversation, to your point, Dr. Darity, about how we get access to economic justice, right? Yeah. How we get access to that's, the point, that's the point of it all, really, is about access and opportunity. You know, when we talk about the inequalities, the inequities, the injustices that permeate and continue to thrive today, at the core of it is limited access or no access at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, what matters most besides the emotional cues and the things that we typically derail conversations about reparations with, what matters most is the data that we can actually measure. Right. You know, one talk uh, to us about some of the current wealth and economic disparities that continue to limit opportunities for black people in America, specifically the descendants of slaves here. So tell us about how the justice system though Ryan, and this is for you, how does the justice system factor into and intercept, if not worsen, these disparities that already exist economically? Mm -hmm. So really concretely, one of the ways that that happens up here is we make very deep investments in incarcerating black people. Yeah. You know, so we talked about the racial wealth gap that bears repeating that in New Jersey, the median net wealth for white families, $352,000, highest net wealth of any family in the country, for black families, it's $6,100. That's a staggering disparity in wealth. But we also have a staggering disparity in incarceration. So in New Jersey, a black adult, 12 times likely to be in prison than a white adult. A black kid is 21 times more likely to be 
in prison than a white kid. The highest black to white adult and youth incarceration disparity rates in the country. And the, and the truth is, as folks know, the research shows that black and white people commit most offenses at about the same rate. Yeah. Most racial disparities don't reflect actual participation in crime, such that in New Jersey today, a state of nine million people, you know, most death talks about today's mathematics, so I'm just gonna go with yes. that thing, today's mathematics, New Jersey, a state of nine million people, there are eight white kids in prison. Wow. Wow. Dr. Wow. Wow. Now, here's the thing. We're not advocating for the putting more white people in prison. Take the black people out. What we, are, what we are saying is that when white kids get in trouble, there's a decidedly different response. That's right. And black and black also reflected in, in, in school disciplinary practices as well, where yeah. you actually have kids who are preschoolers who get suspended from school. I mean, it's just uh, it's unfathomable, but it's uh, so, so. But if you say, yeah, go ahead. So on, on Safir's point about the investment, so so yeah. when New Jersey invests in incarceration, particularly youth incarceration, we got to be very clear. Those are specific investments in incarcerating Black and Brown kids. Now, here's the investment part: okay. New Jersey this year, under a Democratic governor's leadership, I want to lift that up because folks often think that some parties are better than others. I think Public Enemy put it well when they said <laughs> 30 years ago, the yeah. neither party is mine, not the jackass or the elephant. I think black folks really gotta be clear about whichever party's in power, we gotta hold them ac accountable, right? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. under democratic leadership in New Jersey, the state is spending $300,000 to incarcerate each Kid, and these are black and brown kids. Now, yeah. here's how that matters because I said about this stuff here, but we're in a pandemic. We've not seen anything like this in our lifetimes. Right. Virtual learning, kids, schools are, are closed for kids to come in. So kids are required to learn at home. My wife, folks know, Principal Avon Avenue School, District School, amazing school, doing amazing work. All of her kids learning virtually, as are the other kids in Newark public school systems. The challenge though is in order to learn virtually, you have to have a computer and access to the internet, which right. a good number of them don't have. In New Jersey, conservative estimates are that 250,000 kids don't have either of those. <laughs> Makes virtual learning virtually impossible, right? Absolutely. But what we're doing as we're not investing in systems that provide internet and an opportunity to learn at home is spending $300,000 to incarcerate black and brown kids. Which is almost the equivalent of the, uh, the, the the racial wealth gap in New Jersey. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there it is. So when you, when, and this is, look, this is not hy hyperbolic or conspiracy theory talk. These are, just, these are most depths today's mathematics. Mm -hmm. that, like the Bible says, like, where your treasure is, there your heart is also, right? So, we know, so we, where is New Jersey's heart, heart yeah. as it relates to black people? Yeah. And we've made very generous and intentional and specific investments in incarcerating black kids. We have not made investments in helping black kids win. Yeah. And that's what the charge is for us. So I go back to the party piece. You know, we, we it's really up to us that whichever party's in power, it's ridiculous that right now there aren't bills moving in every state to look at every state's responsibility with respect to repairing harm from structural racism. I'm not, I'm not talking about the symbols, though they're important. I'm not talking about removing Confederate flags and state flags, though that could happen. I'm not talking about painting Black Lives Matter on streets or, or right. Black Lives Matter signs in their yards, though they should. But I'm actually talking about also making Black Lives Matter really by doing investments and policies to yeah. reverse redesign systems that were designed to harm us. And until we get to that space, we're just gonna be talking and throwing words and doing symbols and people will think the symbol is itself a symbol of progress, right? but it's actually not getting to the underlying issue that the symbol reflects. Yeah, before well, we turn on. Up, yeah. Because symbolism is often used to replace the action that's necessary to report, repair these harms. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's factual. We see it every day. 
Uh, and one symbol for that matter was the election of America's seemingly first black president as was announced and was done historically countrywide numbers. Uh, black people came out in historic numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course he had votes from every segment of the country uh, mm -hmm. outside of the black community as well. But about 12 years ago, President Obama himself boycotted a UN racism conference, which he said unfairly singled out Israel in its conflict with Palestine. Mm -hmm. And clearly that conference demonstrated the world's readiness, at least to some degree, to address or at least discuss discrimination and to some degree reparations. Yeah. Now, the event in fact, that I think, I, I, yeah, the, the conference was called the World Conference Against Racism. Right. And, uh, and an important theme of that conference was uh, exactly that, the question of reparative justice across countries. Uh, you, uh, uh, Ryan, you you noticed my whiteboard uh, before we started our conversation this evening, and it's there because I am teaching remotely. So I have a special sensitivity to the issue that you're talking about. Uh, although my students at Duke University generally are extremely affluent, there are some who have had some difficulty participating and we've had to make sure that they have internet access as well as the appropriate machinery, the laptop or the like, to, to allow them to continue to participate in their classes. And this has to be a far more dramatic problem for uh, communities that do not come, uh, where the kids don't come from families with the same types of resources that we have. Uh, I, I do want to say that there's an important quotation that we reproduce in our book from Malcolm X, which speaks directly to the kinds of issues that we're concerned about now, where Malcolm X talks about an individual who had a knife plunged into their back. Mm -hmm. And then he says, uh, you know, it might be pulled out six inches, uh, but that's not, uh, that's not sufficient. And, and it might be pulled all the way out but that's not sufficient because it's one thing to end the harm and it's another thing to compensate people for the effects of the harm, which is what he refers to as healing the wound. Both are necessary. You need to stop the harm, but that is not reparation. Right. Reparations is compensation for the effects of the harm or healing the wound. And that's a critical distinction we need to make in thinking about the types of policies that people are saying should be enacted. I think most of the policies that people talk about that should be enacted are the equivalent to pulling the knife out, but they don't take that important next step of compensating people for the harms that have been incurred or healing the wound that has been inflicted by the knife. Um, and then a uh, the last thing I'd like to mention is there's actually a relationship between incarceration and wealth. Yes. Uh, we, we demonstrate in a paper that we did that there are two directions in which that can occur. Uh, the first direction is people who are incarcerated obviously have more restricted, con more restricted consequences in terms of their capacity to acquire wealth. Uh, and so being incarcerated further depresses your, your net worth level. Uh, but the other direction is an interesting one, which has to do with discrimination and the uneven application of the criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, black, young black men with, uh, with, with twice the level of wealth of a corresponding white man. And so now we're talking about relatively low income, low wealth white. Okay, but black young men with twice the wealth of, of lower wealth white men are far more likely to experience incarceration as they move into adulthood than, uh, than the young white men. So, so even, having, uh, even having some margin of wealth does not protect you or insulate you from uh, disproportionately unfair treatment by the criminal justice system. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then you also have the issue where oftentimes the justice is already served for young white um, juveniles, uh, whereby there's interventions at the station that get applied rather than actual imprisonment, right. uh, which is often not an option made available to black youths. Um, 
so you make a very poignant uh, point there. And, and certainly uh, there are a number of points still yet to be made, right? When we talk about how we've seen uh, at the UN conference, at least some sign of progress where there's a willingness to have this conversation, we still see resistance here in America. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question then is if in the event that black reparations goes or gets unduly delayed or continues to meet objection, what legal recourse, Ryan, might be available uh, with courts at the national or international level beyond that point? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. You know, litigation, litigation is really difficult um, in part because there's this doctrine called latches. It's a defense that is applied when people are sued and it essentially is a doctrine of timeliness so that you, you're, you're required to bring a lawsuit within some period of time from when the harm commenced. And so very often, you know, there was a, a solo practitioner, a black woman in the early 2000s, which uh, she was filing a number of cases against some of the insurance companies uh, that had insured against the loss of uh, slave ships and enslaved people. And the defense that the, that the defendants proffered was the doctrine of latches. And she ultimately lost because the court said, you didn't bring this, these lawsuits in time. And of course, she's, when else could I have, <laughs> when else could I have brought the lawsuit? I, I wasn't alive back then, but I'll but be clear, the harm endures. So the lawsuit is timely in terms of the harm is that the person is wrong. So I think, I think litigation is a, is a challenge, but I do think there's lots of promise in state legislature. So we'll talk a bit about this when, when, when Assemblywoman Tucker comes on the line, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in state legislatures and city councils to push elected officials to begin to take seriously this conversation we're having. Not enough places are having even a conversation around what could reparations, what could it look like once we admit that there has been harm? And I think state legislatures are an important part to, point to do that. You mentioned there's federal legislation uh, John Conyers, but before he passed, introduced 35 years ago or so, I think, Dr. Darity, uh, legislation that would create a task force at the federal level that would co create a commission that would look at how slavery has happened in the country, and then they'd make recommendations around policies to put in place and investments to make to address that harm. That legislation sat for three decades. It finally got a hearing at the end of 2019, the end of last year, at which ta Coates and Sherilyn Eiffel, a number of other um, folks testified in support of it, but it, but it hasn't moved, which is really the story of what's happening at the national level. But I do think we could talk more about this at this moment, while we're still in the, the George Floyd at all moment, to really begin to push state legislatures to create a reparations task force in their states to really begin to grapple with this conversation we're having here. Yeah, I, I think the litigation issue is a critical one. There has not been much success in litigating for reparation. Uh, I, I believe that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. yesterday, a new uh, lawsuit was entered. But uh, in 2005, uh, the district court threw out the lawsuit for the 1921 massacre on precisely the grounds you're talking about, claiming that the litigants had waited too long uh, to come forward with the case, and then the Supreme Court refused to hear the appeal. Uh, so I, I think that we do have to focus very heavily on going the, uh, the legislative route for a reparations project. And, and I, I want to say that I don't think it's adequate to try to rely upon state and municipal governments. Yeah. And the reason is the following. I, I think that the central objective, the economic objective of a reparations project, there are other objectives, but the economic objective should be to eliminate the racial wealth gap. And that will require an expenditure of at least 10 to $12 trillion. The total budget of all state and local governments in the United States combined for all purposes that they use the funds for amount to about $3.1 trillion. Mm -hmm. So they simply are incapable 
of meeting a bill that would erase the racial wealth differential. So that's that's the first reason why it should be the federal government that we focus on. The second reason is because the federal government is the culpable party. It is the federal government that bears responsibility for the laws, the authority framework, or turning a blind eye to the atrocities that have shaped or built the racial wealth gap. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's really, really critical for us to, uh, to be concerned about. Uh, one last comment in this context. Uh, I, I think it's important to have a, uh, a national commission, congressional commission that addresses the question of reparations that was something that was done in advance of the provision of reparations for Japanese Americans mm -hmm. for being unjustly incarcerated in, 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 uh, during World War II. And that commission was called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. We do probably need a similar type of commission to provide a report as a prelude to a national reparations program for Black Americans. But unfortunately, the existing legislation that you mentioned, HR 40, mm -hmm. is inadequate to the task of providing us with a commission that will generate an appropriate report. And I have argued and for, a number, uh, for a number of reasons that that legislation needs to either be revised or replaced. Because unfortunately, whatever changes were made between 1989 when it was first introduced and the present moment, those changes have not been to the benefit of the legislature. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, just, just, uh, just one point further yeah. to Dr. Derry. I think that's, I absolutely agree that there's a federal response. I also think though that we have to hold states accountable for the way that they design systems right. that have exacerbated the things that happen at the federal level. And I, I love this, I love the point about the needing to have robust discussions through commissions. I think that part of the way they're going to move, if they're, if they're, if this conversation is going to move legislatively, it's going to require all the folks watching this, once we get off this slide, to begin to push their elected officials very hard. Yeah. Because I think one of the things I've learned is that no matter the politician, right, whether he or she considers him or herself a progressive or whatever they, particularly progressive. Oftentimes, elected officials are keepers of the status quo. They mm -hmm. just are. And unless they're pushed, they will maintain the status quo, but sound in progress. Yes. So if it's not fair. Oh, you want rep? Look, I'm all for reparations. Woo! They'll even give you, remember Denzel Washington in Glory? When he right. shed a single tear, that was mass. They'll even give you the Denzel Washington Glory single tear. <laughs> but they then won't follow that single tear with action. So I think one key takeaway from this conversation is if what we want is to move this forward legislatively, we have to organize and, and, and tell folks we won't support them if they don't do this thing. This is not, a, this is not another, we don't, we're not talking about a June King holiday, though we deserve that. We're not talking about Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill, though we deserve that. But these yeah. kinds of, these things are beyond simple. These are getting to the things that the symbols reflect and politicians are low to go there because they're thinking, if I do this thing that Safir or Dr. Darity or Ryan are asking, can I get elected again? Right. Till they believe that they won't get elected unless they do this thing, they will not, they will not move. Absolutely. And, and to your point, Ryan, to your point, I've had conversations and debates with folks leading up to this discussion where I keep getting told that it's impossible. It's something that should never be expected. And then I remind them that your silence is consent with <laughs> the status quo that the gatekeepers continue to perpetuate. Right. And so until we collectively come together and make it apparent that there is a large support for such a movement, we will never see such a change. But the fact is, is that just like you said, through the examples that you provided, uh, through the uh, reparations previously paid to other groups of peoples here in America, there's already a prototype available. There's a blueprint available. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes we get in our own way because we limit how far we will reach when we make demands. Yeah. You talk, about, 
AR-40 not being far reaching enough, but the fact is we come together, we put forth these requests or proposals for legislation and we're not reaching far enough. We're looking at a limited space of what can we accomplish now. And while that might be noteworthy at times for such a task as this, it's something that has to take a backseat. Ryan? Yeah, and I was going to say, I think to our folks, especially black folks, and black folks are talking about what's impossible. We got to encourage them and then shut their mics off. Because the story of black people in this country has been all about how we have made impossible things entirely possible, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the story of us in this land. So I think if when folks are like this impossible, they're not connected to the reality of our persistence in this country, nor is their imagination adequate to meet the challenges that we face. So I think we have to encourage folks that impossibility is a thing. We, we specialize in impossibility. But if we're ever going to win in this country, we have to get to the place where rep reparations are, are, are made available, where repairing harm becomes real. Yes, definitely. I've noticed uh, some of the comments in the chat. They're great comments. Somebody yeah. just said, Yvette, as Yvette Carnell says, politicians respond to pressure, not praise. Mm -hmm. Something else she has said is, uh, is, 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 is politics is not a gift, it's, a, it's an exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and unfortunately, Black Americans have not gotten very much in exchange mm -hmm. for our support uh, for, for either political party, depending on what phase in time you're looking at. Uh, yeah, so this, this, is, this, is, this is really important, this question of how we hold politicians accountable, what type of pressure we apply to them, uh, yeah. And uh, and and I I will say this, uh, I I used to have the view that you shouldn't pursue reparations because the odds of receiving reparations were so low, but mm -hmm. about thirty years ago I began to say to myself, look, if it was eighteen nineteen and I was living in the United States, I might think slavery will never come to an end. But I sure hope that I would have been resistant to slavery. And so that led me to say to myself, even if the odds are long for reparations, it's the right thing to do. And I should be engaged in the process of working for it. And, and I will have to say that the present moment is very different from any other that I've ever experienced with respect yeah. to the issue of reparations. Uh, if you look at a study that was done in 2000, by um, Ravana Popoff and, and uh, Michael Dawson at the University of Chicago, it indicated that 4% of white Americans endorsed reparations for black Americans. That's F-O-U-R, 4%. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the proportion had risen to about 15%. Mm -hmm. And then in a study that was conducted in June uh, by the organiza organization Civics, it indicated that 39% of white Americans now endorse reparations for black Americans. And even if that study is off by about nine percentage points, it still would be 30%, which is doubling the proportion that were in favor of reparations only a year and a half ago. So, so, so my argument is we ought to seize that momentum. And, and, and the other thing that has bothered me. I, I'm talking a lot, but the other thing that has bothered me is the fact that there are black people who are opposed to reparations. Mm -hmm. Can I, you know, so I just, I just it, Sheila Montague, I saw to your point, Dr. Darity just lifted up this quote which struck me where she says that we're not at the yes. table, then we're on the menu. <laughs> and and I, I, I love that because I, I think we are, you know, we are, we're one of the most reliable, I think we must, I think we are the most reliable voting block. Yes, we are. With real talk, if, if Joe Biden wins, right, it's going to be because black folks organized, pulled the lever, supported him. You'll need some more, but black folks will be critical to that. Here in New Jersey, Governor Murphy received 94% of the black vote the right. first time he won. He only got 47% of the white vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for that robust support from black folks, Governor Murphy may not be the governor. But for robust black support for uh, Joe Biden, he may not be the president, right? 
But the question that, that, that she lifts up and that you raised, Dr. Darity, is, but in exchange for that near unanim unanimous support, we rarely ever get a specific black agenda. That's right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and in many ways, we, we get taken for granted, like, oh, black people will vote for me. I will identify. I'll appoint a black person to a position. That's how I'm going to that's how I'm going to that's how I'm going to repay black folks for their yeah. near unanimous support. A vice presidential candidate who has said they would never do anything just for black people. Yes. Yes. And so for us, you know, by that candidate clearly and, and without divination. <laughs> and if we game this out in New Jersey, Governor Murphy's up for re-election yeah. next year. Very yeah. soon, right? Very soon, he'll be making his way across New Jersey, visiting every black church he can find, high-fiving, waving, pointing, right? The symbols. Because the symbolism is that he came to the space. But the uh, you know, he's he's also uh he's also an advocate of a program that I like in principle. Uh, in part because I helped develop this project, which is what he's calling a baby bonds proposal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and he's saying mm -hmm. that he's going to try to propose to the New Jersey legislature that a thousand dollars be placed in each newborn infant. Uh, each, yeah. in, in each new each newborn infant would be given a trust account for a thousand dollars. So, so I have two issues. Uh, the first issue is that the way in which we originally designed this was the idea was uh, for the amount to vary right. with the mm -hmm. level of wealth of the child's family. Not that every kid would get exactly the same amount. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's my first problem. The second problem I have is he is using this policy to make a claim that it addresses racial wealth inequality, mm -hmm. not just inequality in general. Right, and right. it can have some marginal effect on the magnitude of racial wealth inequality. But when you're talking about uh, virtually a $350,000 differential in average household wealth, uh, you know, something that a kid can pick up at the end of 18 years that would be worth about $1,300 is not going to do much to address that wealth differential. So don't, don't call it a policy that will affect the racial wealth gap. And right. so, uh, so that that that's 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 the issue I have with that. And look, I, I think I, to your point, I love. I think the baby bonds issue, baby bonds issue, is an important important step in the right direction. But look, the question sure. is, what does ninety four percent of a group's vote get you? Yeah, right. And ninety four percent. If those folks have are on the other side of this kind of racial wealth gap, if they have the worst black to white adult and youth incarceration disparity rates in the country. If black people in New Jersey, as we do, confront some of the worst racial disparities in the country, and we cast our ballots at a tune of 94% for one candidate, what is that candidate's specific plan for those people? Yeah. Baby bonds is an important step to be sure, but to your point, that had, you need a specific tailored response to address the specific- Baby Bonds is designed as a universal program. It's not something that is specifically for black people. So it's not clear how it could reduce the black white wealth gap in any significant way. I mean, you're giving everybody, every kid the same thing. Yeah, agree. Yeah. And really quickly, um, obviously there have been many people over the years who have lent their lives to working toward this effort, uh, this push, this initiative to really have serious and meaningful conversations about reparations. Uh, those include, of course, uh, yourself, Dr. Darity, um, Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, we have those as well who would include Yvette Carnell herself and Antonio Moore. Uh, so mentioning those names, I think is important in the context of this conversation. Uh, but really quickly, I do wanna take this opportunity to introduce our fourth uh, participant in this conversation, the third panelist, uh, Mary Brown. Uh, Mary Brown uh, was originally a software engineer, uh, and she left a role uh, at an esteemed organization to answer what she felt was an undeniable need to address the gap that exists between conditions of today and the acquisition or attainment of reparations tomorrow. Uh, and so I'd like to welcome to the broadcast, Mary Brown. Hi. Can I... Uh... Hello, Mary. She calls me the chief. Hi. 
officer and founder of um, the organization called The Case for Black Reparations. Uh, so thank you for joining. We are glad to have you. Um, I appreciate your flexibility in joining through the change in technical platform. I just want to say that my my sound is like 10 seconds behind. So, uh, but I, I definitely just want to say, hey, everybody. And um, I'm really appreciated. I'm really appreciative for even being a part of this interview. Um, and I had a lot of points that I want to bring up in addition, but the main things I wanted to say was just thank you for having me and um, I'll get in when I fit in. So thank you so much. So really quickly, Mary, I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, you run a nonprofit. It's focused on bridging the gap between today's economic conditions for Black Americans and the attainment of reparations yes. uh, to the degree that a time could even be established that that occurs. Yeah. So you said that as a people, we can't afford to wait, but we must go and get some type of reparations for ourselves. How do you suppose something like that gets done? So um, one, it starts with education. So like how we were talking, because I've been listening for like the past um, 30 minutes or so, I've definitely been picking up where it's been told that um, there are these legal cues that we can do. So we can actually uh, do something like an intentional affliction of emotional distress. Like all of these ways um, we as a conglomerate of Black Americans can pretty much say, hey, we're getting really serious about this. I'm researching it. I see what, what has happened for the other um, ethnicities that had reparations cases. So the Hawaiians, the Japanese Americans, the Native Americans, and there was one more group, if I'm not mistaken, um, the Native Americans. So how each and every one of them had to create a commission like uh, Dr. H uh, Dr. <laughs> was talking about. In these creations, we just have to make sure that um, we're getting the people that can actually interface properly with the people that need, that are capable of enacting these laws. So maybe us as just regular individuals in a town can know, you know, we don't have the people in our networks to get some laws changed and all we can do is grassroots lobbying. But with that being said, let's figure out who we need to talk to so that we can actually enact some grassroots lobbying and enact some change in that way. Very good, thank you so much. Um, in that same vein, Dr. Sandy, in your work, you answered the overused question, the over asked question about whether the United States can even afford to pay reparations to black folks. In your account, where does the money come from? Uh, the money comes from the same place that the money came from overnight to finance the CARES Act and other responses to the current crisis. Uh, and it's particularly noteworthy that that money came forward without there being any increase in taxes. And so I would argue that it is quite plausible to enact a reparations program one that would eliminate the racial wealth gap over the course of a decade uh, without having any significant increase in taxes in the United States. Uh, what we have to be concerned about with any new federal expenditure for whatever purpose is what are the consequences for inflation? And we have to be cognizant of the inflation risk. That's the true barrier to additional federal spending. It's not the deficit, because the deficit is not necessarily a debt that has to be paid. You can increase the deficit without increasing indebtedness, governmental indebtedness. And so what we do have to be concerned about is whether or not we reduce the value of our currency in some significant way by the new expenditure. And so we'd have to design a reparations program accordingly. And in the final chapter of our book, From Here to Equality, we talk about how that might be done. Uh, but our most recent experience demonstrates that it's quite possible to substantially increase federal expenditure without touching taxes at all. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, obviously there are gonna be some complications with regards to revaluing um, the dollar, as you've mentioned, uh, and really getting folks to galvanize around such an effort. But there's always a question that tends to get asked when the numbers surface in this conversation. 
Uh, and that is, are there alternatives to cash payments that might have an impact needed to meet the goals of reparations? Why or why not? I think there are always alternatives, but it's not clear that they're desirable. Uh, I don't usually talk about cash payments. I call, I, I usually talk about direct payments to potential recipients. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very receptive to the idea of providing people with trust accounts or endowments. But I think that the serious issue is whether or not the preponderance of the funds should go to direct payment, which I, I think they should, rather than programmatic initiatives, community-wide initiatives and the like. I, I would like to give individual Black Americans as much discretion as possible over the use of the funds if they choose to form some sort of collaboration with their new wealth for the purposes of starting a new business enterprise or acquiring a business enterprise. That's fine, but that's up to them. Uh, I, I don't think that we should be using the resources to finance other types of activities in any significant way. Perhaps some portion of the funds could go to support HBCUs, but the majority of the funds should be direct payments to individuals. And I'm especially skeptical about community-wide or neighborhood-wide uh, initiatives in a world in which we are experiencing rapid, rapid gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of, of Washington, D.C., for example, is truly no longer a chocolate city. Uh, and if you were to make neighborhood level investments in that city, the funds would not get to the people who merit them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. Um, so I, I would just say that, you know, along with that, those financial investments, we've got to design a system that works for, for black people. So, you know, one thing that comes to mind, for example, in, in New Jersey, you know, we are, I mentioned we're the second wealthiest state. I think we're also probably the second or third most racially diverse state. Uh, but we're also one of the most racially segregated states. So we've got this wealth that exists alongside this really punishing poverty. We've got this incredible racial diversity that exists along really stringent racial segregation. So I think as we think about um, financial investments in our folks, we also have to be building a brand new system of policies, practices, and laws that fill in the cracks of our crack foundation of cracks of these cracks of structural racism. So for example, really quickly on the education piece, my wife has been teaching in Newark for better than 20 years at three different district schools, uh, classroom teacher for nine at Bergal Avenue School, vice principal for five at, uh, at Chancellor Avenue, and then has been the principal for the last 10 years at Avon Avenue School. Uh, 20 years teaching three different district schools, thousands of kids, amazing teachers, amazing students, amazing communities, but she's never had a white kid, not one <laughs> white kid in 20 years. So generations of these kids have grown up in classrooms where they shared no space with white kids. She will be quick to tell you that what she's not saying is that black kids need to be alongside white kids to learn. That's not what she's saying. No. What she will tell you is that green follows white. Yeah. That green dollars follow white kids. Yes. And that the way New Jersey is designed, you have to go to school in the area where you live. Now, we think, well, that's a community school and we choose to go here. Right. But imagine this. Imagine if half of my wife's students decide they want to go to school in Melbourne. They want to go to school in Livingston, where there are no white, where there are no black students. You will quickly see how the design is to ensure that our kids don't get access to those right. things that those white kids enjoy. And so while we make yes, yes, absolutely to Dr. Daddy's point, absolutely yes, deep financial investments to restore, to repair harm, so too must systems follow that dismantle the structural racism say racism that advantages those kids. Those kids do not, they do not want to share their spaces or their resources with the with these kids, which is why we have law. We have 561 cities in New Jersey. Each of them has a school board, a police force, a fire department. There's a reason, there's a reason for that. And it's part of the reason is to ensure that we live in very segregated neighborhoods 
concentrated by race and extreme poverty. Absolutely. Uh, so really quickly, Dr. Sandy, I want to turn to you. Um, the bill at the federal level, H.R. 40, originally introduced, by the way, by John Conyers in 1989. It's the bill, as you already stated, that would study or commission a study and develop reparations proposals for African-Americans. Since 1989, until this day, that bill has still not been passed. What, in your opinion, makes today so different? Um, I, I think that the response to the, uh, the, the highly visible execution of George Floyd leading to the acknowledgement that, um, that anti-Black police violence has been something that is a long-standing factor in American life uh, has galvanized uh, a, a large segment of the population to, to say that we need to take seriously uh, certain kinds of changes to try to produce greater racial equity. And a lot of people who are not necessarily yet enthusiasts about reparations are receptive to the idea of the formation of a commission to study reparations. Uh, the difficulty from my perspective, as I said, is that I don't think that the law is, is satisfactory. Um, and, and um, you know, one of the central reasons why I think there are problems with the law are changes that were made in the law between 2015-2016 and 2016-2017. Uh, originally, the law specified that there would be seven commissioners, three of whom would be appointed by the president, three by the uh, Speaker of the House, and one by the president pro tempore of the Senate. Uh, I've never really fully understood why any of the, uh, the, the commissioners would be appointed by, by the president, since this is a congressional commission, but that's how the law was originally writ written. Uh, in addition, in, in the 2015-2016 version, the budget for the commission is approximately uh, $8 million. Uh, if you look at the 2016-2017 version, you now have 13 commissioners and a budget of $12 million. And the 13 commissioners are, are, uh, are, are counted by including an additional six who are supposed to be representatives of organizations that have played a historical role in advocating reparations. So who are those organizations? Well, it becomes transparently clear as a consequence of their own description of their engagement with this bill that the National Coalition on uh, Black Reparations in America or the organization uh, called NCOGRA uh, systematically rewrote the bill themselves. Uh, and they rewrote the bill in such a way that they could incorporate themselves into the commission directly. Uh, is there something wrong with that? Yes, mm -hmm. there are two things that are wrong with that. The first is that the legislation provides for the commissioners to receive GS-18 salaries. Mm -hmm. GS-18 salaries are approximately $200,000 per annum. My sense is that commissioners should not be receiving a salary for performing this national service. Uh, they can certainly receive compensation for their expenses, but they should not be receiving a salary. They should have a paid professional staff to support their efforts, but they should not be receiving a salary themselves. So, so that's the first problem. The second problem is INCOBRA and its allies have a vision of reparations that is not consistent with what I think, what other members of the ADOS community think is the appropriate way to design a reparations project. They do not have a commitment to the provision of reparations specifically for black Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. They do not have a commitment to the notion that funds should actually go to individual recipients. In fact, uh, in, in their allies' NARC's 10-point preamble, they specify that there should be something created, I, I presume under their leadership, uh, called the National Trust, uh, the National Reparations Trust Authority, and it would be responsible for managing all of the reparations funds. I think that's very, very different from saying 
that we want individual black Americans right. to have the capacity to have discretion over the fund. The final thing where they differ is that they have no commitment to eliminating the racial wealth as an objective of their reparations project. In fact, they don't tell us what the metric is for success under their reparations project. So I'm very nervous about them having the capacity to actually write the report that's delivered to Congress to produce the reparations plan. Wow, uh, very enlightening information. Um, you certainly touched on a few points that I had not yet uh, researched myself. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and you, very, you paint a very vivid picture about the vast gap that exists between the stances of this group versus those who would be recipients or those of the ADOS commit, uh, community. Um, really quickly, Ryan, I do want to question you briefly about, we know that HR 40 at the federal level is occurring. Uh, it's of course been delayed, if not denied for all of these years since 1989. Um, we also know that some of the information you've shared with us is related specifically to New Jersey. What I'd like mm -hmm. to know is just for our viewing audience is what differing initiatives are we seeing in other states? Uh, regarding the introduction of such legislation? Yeah, it's a great, great question, Safir. So, you know, it's, it's, um, I should say that no state has ever passed legislation that even seeks to look at the issue of reparations. Um, and the reason is not because states don't think that it's due, but because they're worried to Dr. Darity's point that when they undertake to examine the harm, they're worried about what the recommendation will be around the cost. So California recently moved through its assembly a bill that would create a task force that would look at the role that slavery played in California and make recommendations around how to address it. The city of Asheville, I know Dr. Darity can speak more to this, the city of Asheville uh, the city council passed a bill, which they styled a reparations bill, where they essentially direct city government resources very intentionally to try to respond to the way that slavery happened in North Carolina. Uh, here in New Jersey, last November, we had an event at NJ Pat downtown, our performing arts center, where we had a conversation with Nicole Hannah Jones. Folks know that she was the, uh, the champion of the 1619 Project, really groundbreaking work around uh, 1619 and the enduring legacy of slavery. After that event, we then in Trenton stood with a handful of uh, courageous black elected officials who, um, who introduced a bill that would create what we're thinking of as a reparative justice task force. Uh, the bill will one, take a look at New Jersey's role in slavery and take responsibility for it. And then two, we'll make very specific policy recommendations and recommendations to the kinds of investments that ought to be made to repair the harm. That bill was introduced in November. It was introduced again this year. And the truth is it hasn't, it hasn't moved. It was a heavy lift to get it introduced. And I wanna be clear, we're talking about a task force, right? Mm -hmm. Very often we talked about how politicians are often uh, keepers of the status quo. Very often, politicians create task forces when they don't want to do things, right? <laughs> That's just the truth. Am I right, Dr. Yeah. Gary? The task force is usually when you want to kick the can down the road or when it's fourth and long and you got to pump the other side of the field. Yeah. The task <laughs> force is not usually a come up. <laughs> but because it's been so difficult to have a conversation like this one in an official setting, folks like us are pushing for a task force. And so, Safir will drop in the chat a link. I encourage you all, so if you're in New Jersey, please organize your sphere of influence to regularly use this link. It's a tool called Phone to Action. We've had 10,000 interactions already. It'll identify your state elected official and it will allow you to correspond with them and with the governor to urge them to move this bill, to get a hearing and then to move it through the legislature to the governor's desk, right? There, as I mentioned, next year, every seat is up in the New Jersey legislature, the assembly, the Senate, the governor. There's a real opportunity for us at the state level to hold them accountable 
by saying we want you to move this bill before we can even think about supporting you for the office you're running for, for re-election. The other piece I want to lift up is that city councils can be powerful places to get resolutions passed in support of this kind of thing at the state level. So I think we can organize our city councils to pass uh, resolutions in support of the state legislation and then move our state legislators to, to sign it. If you're not in New Jersey, I encourage you to find your legislator. So find out who's in your district, who represents you, reach out to him or her and tell him or her you want them to introduce legislation of this kind. We can share it with you, the kind we use in New Jersey, you can find California's, we can work with Dr. Gary to create one for your state, but then begin blowing up your state elected officials to get them to pass this bill. And then talk to your federal, federally elected officials to finally move a bill at the federal level. It's a shame that it's been 1989, right? That was the year public enemy dropped, fight the power. Remember that starts off 1989, the number another summer, right? It's 31 years. Remember the sound of the fall? Yeah, y'all should know that. 1989, it's 2020. That bill right. had the hearing in 2019. Yeah. Come on, you all. It, like, if there's any moment now to face down impossibility and do things that our ancestors would thought, thought would be impossible, it's now. I mean, I think about them often. Like, when they were in the throes of slavery, resisting it, they couldn't have imagined that we'd be having these kinds of conversations using Zoom. Come yeah. seated in our cribs, right? Right. Not hungry. Real talk. Absolutely. Well, if, if they got in the 40 acres, they got in the 40 acres, there probably wouldn't be any reason for us to be having this type of conversation at all now. Uh, but they, they didn't. And so there's a debt that's 155 years overdue. Uh, I, I was going to say, I, I would be very grateful if you would send me a copy of the text for the New Jersey legislation. I'd, I'd love to see exactly what it says. Uh, I've been reading several of these, and, and what I think is really significant about the California, the California legislation is, uh, are, are two things. Uh, first, there is a strong component that addresses the need to educate students and young people in the state of California with a more accurate historical story about our country and the state of California's own history with respect to white supremacy. Uh, so I think that's a critical positive dimension of that legislation. The other thing is the law provides for California to engage in advocacy at the federal level for a national reparations program. And I think that that's really critical that you know, we need to build a coalition of support for reparations at the national level. And to have state governments be involved in that process is something of tremendous value. My hometown of Durham, North Carolina, has a city council that voted to, uh, be, to be a lead city in the formation of a coalition to support reparations at the national level. And that's something that I would love to see other communities do as well. Uh, one comment on Asheville, uh, you know, the Asheville case, I wish they didn't call it reparation. Uh, it is an, an example of what Malcolm X described as pulling the knife out rather than healing the wound. And they don't have the capacity to heal the wound because the magnitude of the damage is so severe and it encompasses other communities in such a way that we really do have to think about a national le level strategy for reparations, if, if not just the state level strategy for reparations, but it, it's not something that can be accomplished at the, at the local level. What local localities can pull the knife out to the extent that that's possible, but they cannot, they just don't have the capacity to heal the world. So Dr. Darity, uh, in your book, uh, you talk about implementing policies that are both race conscious as well as race specific. Uh, reparations, for example, would be a very race-specific policy in that it would grant payment directly to descendants of enslaved Africans in America. America. Uh, but you also propose uh, or discuss a trust initiative that grants funds at a tiered level to young Americans, regardless of race, based on their economic status. Yeah, so we don't talk about that in the book, but that's that's the baby bonds proposal. That's right. exactly right. what it is. But, 
the, the, the primary difference, though, is that it would be a tiered approach, uh, similar to what you described earlier. Well, well, no, I think the important thing about baby bonds is the idea that it goes to every American child. Right. It is not something that is intended uh, to specifically address the entire racial wealth gap, which is what 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 would be uh, what would what would require. A, mm -hmm. a, a, a race specific program. Uh, when we talk about race conscious programs, we're talking about uh, projects where uh, everybody gets it, but it might have a disproportionate benefit for a particular group like black Americans. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the baby bonds project, while it could have some mildly greater effect on black Americans, because it's a universal program, it would not go, uh, it would not hardly go all the way towards eliminating the racial wealth gap. You need a race specific program like reparations. I absolutely agree. Uh, and so to that point, as you raised, what would you say are the components of an effective reparations package? Yeah, well, I mean, um, monetarily, it should be sufficient to uh, eliminate the racial wealth gap. And that's why I talked about the 10 to $12 trillion. Uh, in terms of who receives it, it should be Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. In the book, we talk about two eligibility standards. The first is an individual would have to demonstrate that they uh, have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. And that's a lineage standard. The second criteria would be that they uh, would have to demonstrate that for at least 12 years, uh, two senatorial terms, or the equivalent thereof, <coughs> that they uh, would have had to have self-identified on an official document as Black, Negro, or African American. Uh, and an example of the type of official document that can be used is your self-reported race on a census form. Uh, you can make that public information for the to try to establish that you 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 did identify that way at a point before there was some monetary value to being black, uh, and so th those are the two criteria. And then, as as I said further, uh, should be conducted by making uh, direct payment to eligible recipients. All right, so briefly, I would love to open up the floor uh, to both of you um, just to make sure that whatever points that you've held so closely or valued most on tonight that you would like listeners to walk away with, what would that be? Um, and so first, I'll turn to you, Ryan, to share. Uh, what do you think is the most important point that listeners must walk away with tonight? So one, they have a better understanding of where we are today, and two, they can galvanize and become mobilized to action. Yeah, so again, yeah, thanks for hosting this conversation. So I it's so great to spend this time with you, Dr. Darity. I guess I want to lift up a comment from Tansy. Tansy says, um, we're so sick of symbolism, it's exhausting. We need, you know, real guidance on the ground. And so I I really appreciate that sentiment because I think for black people, change in this country has always happened from the ground up. I don't think there's been a moment that I'm aware of where the federal government acted on behalf of black people, where black people didn't make them do it, right? I'm really moved by the Selma, Alabama example. There's a, a picture of John Lewis on my wall here. To my right, he's on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He's 23 or six years old at this time. It's 1965, you all know the story well. He's leading a march along with Amelia Boynton over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And they're doing this to make this country move away from its high ideals and its low practice. They're trying to trying to bridge that gulf. So they're literally put, putting themselves in harm's way. And I don't think that John Lewis or Amelia Boynton could have imagined when in that moment, March of 1965, when they're being brutalized by Alabama state troopers on a bridge named after the Grand Wizard of the Alabama KKK, that within one generation of their sacrifice, the country would elect the first black president of the United States. I don't think they could have imagined that in that moment. Um, and so I, I think about that is the way that change has always occurred for us when we organize ourselves 
from the ground up. And so, and this really is that. This is a from the ground up moment. And yeah. so, wherever we are, whether in Newark or Asheville or Jackson, Mississippi, or um, some Alabama, where we are, we we have more power than we realize, particularly when we organize around a set of issues. And I encourage folks to push hard around reparations. So the first call can be made to your city council member. I want you to introduce a resolution calling for a uh, reparations task force in the state legislature. And then identify a few of your state elected officials who represent your district and say to them, listen, I want you to introduce legislation tomorrow and then you can find a model, New Jersey, Dr. Darity, something like that, California. And if you don't introduce it, I'm gonna run against you. This is real talk. I'm gonna run for your seat. And I'm gonna run on this issue and make the elected official feel the pressure to respond to the vote he or she got, maybe from you, maybe not, to earn that vote. And at the same time, to Dr. Darity's point, continue to push for reparations legislation at the federal level. I think this is a push at every level of our existence, the local level, the state level, the federal level. That ha that's how change has always happened, from the ground up in our communities in a way that resonates in the cities where we live, in the counties, in the states, and ultimately at the federal level. Thank you very much. Um, certainly meaningful guidance that you've offered, uh, and hopefully something that folks can walk away with and immediately implement personally to whatever task they might feel called to pursue. Um, really quickly, Dr. Darity, same question. What is one of the most poignant points that you want folks to walk away from this broadcast holding, either having learned more to better understand the need and justification for reparations or something that would galvanize them to mobilize toward uh, action in pursuit of reparations? So I think that Frequently, we have galvanized and mobilized, but we have received results that are more symbolic than substantive. And so we need to be very careful that what we're pursuing in this particular instance, since, uh, since it, it's, it's amazing to have an opportunity to actually be in a position to think about the real reality of having uh, reparations for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery, we've got to make sure that what we are after is something of substance, something that will actually transform our condition. And I think that that something has to be addressing the racial, the racial wealth gap. Uh, I think that that is the central economic dimension of, of how we have been denied full access to citizenship in the United States. And so for the material condition of full citizenship to be met, we have to have levels of wealth that will permit us to have a proportion of the national, uh, the national largesse that's e at least equivalent to our presence in the United States population. Um, there are generally two schools of thought when it comes to determining eligibility for reparations. Um, many, of course, refer to the fact that you must be proven to be a descendant of an enslaved African here in America, uh, while others mention and, and highlight quite effectively, the fact that um, individuals who are black but enter into the country are already at a deficit because of the residual impacts of not only slavery, but all of the policies that supported the oppression of black people thereafter. Uh, what is your position when it comes to determining eligibility when having to face both those facts? So, uh, you know, I, I've been pretty consistent in saying, uh, that uh, African-American reparations should be specifically for black Americans who were descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States. And the anchoring condition from my perspective is that these are the descendants of the persons who were denied the 40 acre land grants in restitution. And so this is the community that is owed the 155 year old debt. Uh, what is to be said about more recent immigrants who are confronted with American racism? Uh, two comments. One is that uh, they, like the rest of us, uh, need to take advantage of legal recourse 
they need to participate in the electoral process so that there will be uh, elected officials in place who will make sure that the nation's laws are enforced. Because you know, when 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 uh, when policemen engage in anti-black violence, they are committing crimes and they should be prosecuted accordingly. And we have a legal structure that would permit us to do that if we had the will to apply the laws. And so, uh, so that's the recourse that I recommend that's relevant to, uh, to more recent immigrants. Uh, but they are not the descendants of persons who were denied restitution at the end of the period of slavery. And so uh, I don't think that they should be eligible for African-American reparations. Perhaps there's some other type of reparations project that would be appropriate, but it's not the one that we worked on in the pages of From Here to a Club. Mm -hmm. You know, I take I take that point. I think I have I think I've wrestled with where we are in the conversation, right? So it's it's important to recognize that no state has ever passed a bill like this. Most states don't even want to have a conversation mm -hmm. about it, right? We are pushing to get this real talk, a task force passed in New Jersey which no state has ever passed to have an official conversation. So I totally take Dr. Darity's point, but I don't know that I'm at a place where I would, where I would be disqualifying folks who would give, they're really, they're really concrete arguments to make to Dr. Darity's point, which we should make, but I don't know. I don't know where I'm on including additional, additional folks. I mean, slavery took root across the, the world, right? There were people who, who were enslaved in the Caribbean and the islands. I mean, there was slavery in Brazil, there was slavery, all over the world. Yes, but the claim that we make in From Here to Equality is against the United States government specifically. Mm -hmm. And it's a claim that begins with 1776. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. black people throughout the diaspora have reparations claims, but right. they don't all have reparations claims on the United States government. So for example, the CARICOM Commission is engaged in the process of seeking reparations, yeah. but they are not seeking reparations from the United States government. They are seeking reparations from from uh, from Great Britain and from uh, and from France primarily because those are the countries that colonized and enslaved mm -hmm. the ancestors of the folks who are living in those spaces today, and so uh, and and West Africans, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. in countries like Ghana and Nigeria, have a claim on the United Kingdom also. Mm -hmm. sure. But this is a case that is specific to the historical specificity of the U.S. experience. And that's why the focus is on folks who are descendants of persons who were enslaved here. Yeah. So I think you're, I think you're on mute. Thank you both so very much. Um, and to all my panelists, thank you so much for joining on tonight. Uh, certainly the words of wisdom, the guidance that you've offered uh, is meaningful and hopefully something that folks will take to heart and really galvanize around because there is no greater time than now. Uh, you know, reparations is not, it, it, it's not a topic of unattainable pipe dreams, though it is a topic of epic proportions. Any change requires action. So let's not dismiss the idea too quickly because of the social conditioning that has led us to accept the atrocities that we face as normal and as tolerable. The wealth gap that we have to contend with as a people and the economic disparities that we face are not incidental issues. They are the result of forced labor from chattel slavery and the oppressive laws and policies that continue to oppress and marginalize black people even until today. The only way to truly answer for America's original sin is to effectively even the playing field through reparations and restorative justice. I invite you all to join me on Thursday, September 17th for a discussion on food security with sustainability expert Bashira Muhammad of Zuma Mycology in Oregon and in New Jersey. If you haven't yet done so, I invite you to like and follow us on Facebook, or if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe below. Tonight, you have just got into it with Safir, uh, Dr. William Sandy Darity, uh, brother civil rights attorney Ryan Haygood, and sister Mary Brown of the case 
for black reparations. Thank you. And I bid you adieu. Many blessings to you. Mm -hmm.